Okay. Uh, recorded. <coughs> Everybody looks good. Super doop. <laughs> Thank you, Feb. Yes, good evening. Good uh, evening, everyone. Good evening to those joining us from the United States and uh, uh, also those that are joining us from the Pearl of the Orient, the Philippines. Uh, tonight, 
we are going to be talking about uh, sociology. Paase is uh, always talking about the physical sciences, but tonight we're going to change the subject a little bit because it is also science. About uh, a couple of days ago, there was an announcement in Pase that uh, there is an experiment in space about the oloid, about the oloid particle. Apparently, this is uh, a particle that you that you can throw and it maintains its center of gravity. It works on Earth, but they we were trying to find out whether it works in space. But we are not going to talk about that tonight. We are going to talk about the social sciences. And we are, I am going to be joined by Dr. Joe Santos of uh, uh, George Washington University. I am, by the way, Dr. Silverio Cabellian Jr. of uh, the UP College of Medicine and the, the University of the Philippines College uh, Medical Alumni Society in America. I am being joined tonight by Dr. Pes Santiago who is uh, also of the University of the Philippines College of Medicine, chair of the uh, class and uh, chapter development committee of OPMASA. And with me tonight is Dr. Victoria Herrera, who will be doing the question and answer uh, period. So tonight we're going to do away with the physical sciences and we are going to delve with social science. Uh, for the program tonight, the speaker will be introduced by Dr. Felicita Santiago. After Dr. Santiago uh, uh, introduces the speaker, we'll have the speaker and then the question and answer period will be hosted by Dr. Victoria Herrera and Dr. Joe Santos, my colleague in this webinar series, will be giving their closing remarks. So, Pe, the podium is yours. Hello, to one and all. Good morning. If you are in the Philippines right now, I'm. Uh doing this uh, from my hometown of Hagonoy, Bulacan. And we are very honored here to uh, have a very unique uh, speaker as uh, emphasized by uh, Billy, Honorable Dr. Reynaldo D. Pagtakhan, with so many acronyms after his name, as you can see it. He has, uh, he's from uh, Bacoor, Cavite, has four children, and uh, just like the, the dream of people that uh, graduates from the University of the Philippines have uh, come to America for further training. He uh, went to uh, St. Louis University Children's uh, Hospital and uh, is uh, graduated uh, there in 1967. He arrived in Winnipeg from St. Louis in 1968 and became a Canadian citizen in 1974. He is a fellow of the American College of Chest Physicians, 1976. He is currently a retired chest specialist and professor of pediatrics and child health, widely uh, lectured and the author of several journal articles and textbook chapters. When Canadian historian Charlotte Gray featured him in the Canadian Medical Association journal, she noted, and I quote, 
Dr. Pagtakhan has a long and distinguished career as a pediatric respirologist. He provided exemplary care to many young people from all corners of Manitoba society. He enjoyed the reputation as both an academic clinical scientist and a teacher. On November 21st, 1988, Dr. Pagtakhan created history as a political trail blazer, the first Filipino elected to Canada's parliament. He is a member of parliament for Winnipeg North from 1988 to 2004, 16 years. As critic for health, Parliamentary, he was Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister and Senior Cabinet Minister. He helped secure, first, compensation for patients with hemophilia who received HIV-tainted blood, the Aboriginal veterans and former prisoners of war. And second, he took care of funding for the Seven Oak Wellness Center, International Center for Infectious Diseases, and five community centers, including the Philippine Canadian Center of Manitoba. Greater was his gratitude when he persuaded three ministers of immigration to return to Canada on humanitarian grounds, two Filipino deportees, and to cancel the imminent deportation of another two. In his book, Filipino Achievers in USA and Canada, Filipino historian Isabelo T. Crisostomo observed, Pagtakhan's dedication to medicine, medical education, and research is matched only by his passion for community involvement. It commenced shortly after he arrived in Canada in January 1968 and continues until today. Whenever leadership is needed to address varied community challenges, his presence appears ready to oblige. Dr. Pagtakhan penned the Kayumangi editorial, A Challenge to Unity, which promptly united the community. He hosted the UP Vocal Ensemble at the Manitoba Centennial Concert Hall to highlight Filipino music and talents. He appointed to the Winnipeg Police Commission. He helped eliminate discriminatory hiring criteria. He joined following the 1986 People Power Revolution the CIDA, C -I -D -A, Canadian International Development Agency, the program planning mission to the Philippines, which led to the creation of the Philippine Development Assistance Program. He chaired the Board of Presidents of 37 national ethno-cultural associations, which helped advocate for the creation of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. He won for citizens before quasi-judicial tribunals. He helped found the Global College, serving as its founding director at the University of Winnipeg to help advance the well-being of refugees and immigrants and champion human rights. Presently, he serves on the Advisory Council of Immigration Partnership Winnipeg and the Board of Directors of St. Paul's College Foundation in the University of Manitoba. If you look at his picture, you will see so many acronyms after his name. He is an inductee. Uh, he is a lifetime member, King's Privy Council for Canada, PC an inductee, OM, Order of Manitoba, LLD, Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa, UP, Manila, 2002. 
SED, Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa, University of Perpetual Health, Rizal, from the Janela Foundation School of Medicine, 2010. MSc, Master of Science in Philosophy, University of Manitoba, 1969. And of course, MD, UP College of Medicine, 1961. He has been a recipient of Queen Elizabeth's Silver, 1977, Golden, 2002, and Diamond, 2012, Jubilee Medals. Currently, he has a column, a byline in the Filipino Express titled Medicina at Politica, pre-COVID 2012-2020, dealing mostly with Canada's Medicare system, and 2020 to the current time, mostly uh, around the COVID issues. His latest uh, editorial has been about Palestine and Israel. He is a very involved man of science, a teacher, and we are so happy for him to be joining us for sharing what he has learned regarding the mixture of medicina at politica. Dr. Pagtakhan. Thank you. My time. Uh, magandang gabi at magandang umaga po sa lahat. At uh, I am glad that uh, I am participating in your fireside chat uh, on this occasion. But uh, thank you, Feli, for your very kind introduction. I may run again for politics. Dr. Just, certainly I look forward to hearing your remarks at the end, and perhaps you may comment on the application of data science on improving the healthcare system of Canada. And I acknowledge our moderators, Dr. Cabellion and Dr. Herrera, and I certainly will depend on them for guidance during our far side, far, far side chat. Now, do I do? Will I operate my slide, or shall I? Okay. Medicine and politics. So I will touch on both of these uh, topics, and uh, I will focus on Medicare as a consequence of challenge. I call it uh, from Dr. Cavalian. Now, actually, this Medicina and Politica, as uh, written here, almost in our vernacular, is firstly to respect our culture and my deep love for the homeland. And also, it at once allows an automatic translation to medicine and politics. And my goal with the community at large, and particularly the Canadian Filipino community, is to share my insights as I learned from medicine, politics, and community advocacy. So I will give a share of both uh, this, this time. These are the comments I heard that I thought I should really share with you. I have been touched by this quote from our immediate past president of UPMASA, Dr. Cabellion, who said in one of our email exchanges, many hands make heavy work light. This was uh, a reply to my email to him saying, I only could uh, donate and contribute a very modest amount for the simulation lab. And frankly, Dr. Henry Echeverry, our uh, incumbent of Massa president, re-echoed its uh, sentiment and said, any gesture great or small taken together with the rest equates to one great leap. And I see the application of these words of wisdom to many uh, that I'm sure in the future I'll be able to use. And so one of the things I learned during this exercise, and also 
I would like to continue to remember them and thought on the basis I will share with you as well. Now, Dr. Cabellion, in one of, in the many email exchanges that he shared with me, did mention at a couple of times that he would like to see, or at least in, intimates and infers that he would like to see some insights on the sociological impact of politics on health and the sociological perspective of medicine. And so I asked myself, well, I took an optional as a subject at, at pre-med, uh, another course of sociology beyond the first required. But the only line I could remember about sociology is that leadership is a function of time. So this time I got to review some of my uh, basics to understand what he's trying to share with us in terms of his expectation. And so as a consequence of that, I did uh, sort of get this title to, to challenge myself and to convey the message that Canada's Medicare, when I look at it, really is a sociological creation. And this is the brainchild of my son trying to tell us some graphics and because our understanding of health medicine and society will tell us a lot about how we look at our Canadian healthcare system. We are all reminded that uh, the well-being of any human being is, a, is a, a well-being due to the soundness of the physical, the mental, and the emotional components of one's life. At least that is what the WHO has uh, taught us and continues to remind us. What it means is that we will need that healthy, we will need that healthy environment, and that stable mind to ensure that we have a healthy body and a sound human being. We as physicians, we have been trained, or at least uh, during my time, to continue to look at disease or illness as a consequence of a biologic disturbance, whether genes, bacteria, virus, or what have you, we search by and large, finding the scientific basis for illness and disease. So we look for that biologic determinants of illness as a cause, and knowing that, we'll proceed with the diagnosis, treatment, and of course, give advice as to prevention. Medicine, in sociological term, is a social institution. So that is the medical approach. But when we look at society, which is the sociological approach, there are many things that we have to consider, the government itself, the body politics, the culture of the people, and even the social structures that it has that, that uh, relates in our instance on healthcare delivery at this point. And certainly society would look at a healthy citizenry and illness control to ensure that its society functions well. But in looking at this perspective or approach, the sociologists will tell us to consider factors other than the science of illness. And they call that the social, social imagination. That is, we are asked to consider and, and uh, the structural or social basis of illness other than due to, to science alone. And so because so apparently the social determinants can truly explain some aspects of illness other than that due to the bio biological disturbance. And uh, the social culture that I will present with you later in a moment will be on the uh, Canada's Medicare. And this is the social de de determinants that will help us understand that this is part of the anybody, anybody's uh, environment depending on our class status, our level of income, and so on. Certainly constitute together the life's environment. And we remember the need for food, shelter, and clothing. So any aspects of the level of employment, the level of poverty, and how the government looks at these are factors. So, so altogether, this will be the non-medical uh, factors that uh, contribute to the level of illness and disease. And apparently, those factors could constitute up to 55% of the health outcomes in any given patient. 
So the sociologists determine the patterns of disease, not the so-called individual ailment, and how that can be solved by looking at the structural uh, settings in a given community. That instead of blaming the patients or the uh, or the the, the so-called the, the the bearers of illness, that they would look at the structural problems in society and address them. And what a uh, particular example of this now very very sort of relevant is the presence of the healthcare system when government involves itself in uh, healthcare delivery as every government does. And we and we remember. And we remember the social gradient, which is known to all of us, that the poor society has poor health and, uh, and the reverse. Now, the, the categories, the categories of, uh, of deficiencies, if we can call it, in any service uh, situation for a country is whether a given product, uh, say, example, uh, the, 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 if health is a, is a product, is it, is it available, is it acceptable, and is it uh, accessible? And that three factors certainly form part of the Canada's medical system. Now, it is interesting that the history of Canada's Medicare really was a political struggle. And uh, at the end, it was a triumph. And the premier, Tommy Douglas of Saskatchewan, one province in Canada, pioneered this particular uh, healthcare system delivery thing. Now, why was it a political struggle? So what I have in the next slide is to show you the evolution of the system, Canada's Medicare. And I have divided it into about three segments for the size of the print on the slide from 1919 to 1962. 1919, when the veterans were returning from the Great War, worried a number of years from then to that, about what, uh, 20, 40, about 20, 28 years, and then Premier Douglas of uh, Saskatchewan, one one premier of one province um, introduced the uh, health insurance to cover the cost of hospitalization only on hospital services. Now, following this 1944, a decade later, the, at the federal level, the Liberal Party of Canada, the prime minister at the time was St. Laurent, introduced the version of the hospital that it will fund 50% of any provincial uh, government that will uh, participate in this plan of ensuring hospital services. Unfortunately, he lost the election and, uh, and the progressive conservative prime minister, Deepen Becker won, he continued that initiative of uh, offering 50% federal funding to any provincial government who will participate in, in ensuring the hospital services. But it took four years before all the provinces would be on board. Now, meanwhile, in 1961, at about the time that the, all the provinces were in, Justice M. Um, Hall of the Saskatchewan Supreme Court uh, was called to head the first Royal Commission on the National Healthcare System. Even before he could report, some uh, a, a couple of, a, a couple of years later. In 1962, so just a year after the, the commission was still doing its work, the same prime, uh, premier of uh, Saskatchewan intro, uh, introduced the medical services insurance plan. Now we have bought the hospital and the physician services as uh, covered by the insurance. This is where the first struggle was. The doctors, many of them left the province in protest and then those who stayed went on a strike. I must add that when I read a little bit of this history, that the doctors were, went, on, went on a strike, not because of financial greed. It was only a matter of principle that they would not like to be so-called owned by the government. So it's a question of a, a belief in their freedom 
to exercise their profession as they as they, as they saw fit. So, but nevertheless, the impact of this on the system was was there. That is why it took many years before it will be uh, really realized. Then in 1964, when the report uh, was given, in fact, Justice Emmett Hall was recommending both hospital and medical services be, be given national coverage, but in addition, including prescription drugs, as well as home care. Prime Minister Pearson, a Nobel Prize winner uh, for peace, uh, introduced in 1966, both component of this report, the medical services and the hospital, 50% funding to any province that will uh, participate in this program. So it took about six years in 1972 before all 10 provinces would uh, participate. As the cost of uh, these charges, extra charges were being seen, a second Royal Commission by the same Justice Emmett Hall was uh, convened and uh, it gave its report Soon and uh, then in 1984, some four years later, the Prime Minister Trudeau, the senior Trudeau, with the Minister of Health, Manek Bejan, introduced the Canada Health Act. It is interesting to note that the approval of that law was unanimous. The message here is the three political parties, the, the Liberal Party, the NDP before, and the Conservative were all in unison. So there was political leadership, but the opposition from the medical profession made it a slow process in being achieved, but achieved at the end in 1984. In 1988, the Progressive Conservative took over, sent a clarification letter, sort of repeating support for the 1984 Canada Health Act. And today, we now have 224, just last year, Again, a negotiation between the two the levels of government that uh, contributed some 196 billion as a, as a total uh, accord between the provincial and the territorial on one side and the federal on the other side. So we are celebrating about the 40 years of this Canada Health Act of 1984. And today, as I call it now, uh, Premier Douglas has been called as the father of Medicare, having introduced it for the first time in North America, both hospitalization and physician services. But in reviewing history, I thought a social worker who became the Minister of Health, Monique Bejan, equally deserves uh, credit. So I am just putting this historic claim and I call him with the permission of all as the mother of Medicare. Uh, and so this is, uh, not written yet in any history book. But what we have now in front of us is the call for other services outside the traditional bag of Medicare. Just about a couple of months ago, Canada has started on a dental care plan, uh, depending on the age and the income of the family. Those with income about, uh, I think 90,000 could qualify and depending on the age of the child. Just starting, Pharmacare just a couple of months ago, again, for two medications, for one against the diabetes and uh, one for women, uh, I think the contraceptive pills. And again, it is just starting. None of this is yet covered fully by the Medicare, but some layer, of, uh, but uh, so payments for these have come from out of pocket as well as uh, uh, some, some, some government service depending on the provinces. And recently, I was reading about social care, wherein uh, uh, they call this now a prescription that the pharmacist cannot fill because it refers to activities such as uh, socializing, exercise that seniors uh, could benefit from. And there is the new term, social care. So that was the parliament building. This is the, but at the back showing the library where I spent some uh, close to 16 years. A real beautiful edifice, awesome but a rich in history. Now, the reason the Canada Health Act is strong and is still alive, and I think it will continue to be, is because of the five criteria that are really fundamental in the strength of this piece of legislation. The key is public administration, not for profit, 
comprehensiveness, universality, accessibility, and portability. What do they mean? Before going to that, there are two other conditions that must be complied by the provinces to satisfy the requirement of the federal spending power on the part of the federal government. That is no extra billing for practitioner services. So the doctors may not add any extra billing beyond the negotiated cost of, uh, of uh, coverage on, on the, on, between the public administration and the practicing physician, no extra billing. The second condition is that there will be no extra fees, user fees that uh, healthcare facilities would offer. And so with these two conditions, they, I call these the two prohibitions. Now we have the criteria, the public administration, wherein that should be nonprofit and a public authority. And this single payer system has controlled the cost of, uh, of uh, healthcare costs significantly. Comprehensiveness, whereas all the insured health services shall be insured by the insurance plan. It is interesting that this insured health services refer to all necessary medical services as part of the hospitalization, as part of the physician services in a hospital setting. But nobody has defined until now what constitutes medical necessity. But what is really interesting is that there has not been any uh, dispute as to what should be covered. So I think there is goodwill and common understanding on the part of the healthcare system and the providers of care. Universality, but the, the insured person should be entitled to the insured health services we referred to on uniform terms and conditions. In other words, irrespective of your status or class in society. Who are the insured persons? Of course, the insured persons are, are uh, by definition, Canadian citizens, including the landed immigrants. Those on a temporary basis do have to carry their own private plans. <coughs> Accessibility is the fourth uh, criterion and that access to this insured health services again must be on uniform terms and conditions without any other barriers or financial. These financial barriers were the one I referred to earlier, the two conditions, extra user fees and extra billing. Other barriers is refers to say distance because of the diverse nature of, the, of Canada. Some transportation accommodations may have to be made. And this is important when trying to regionalize or regionalize and, uh, the healthcare units and healthcare center. This fourth uh, criterion was not in the original plan that was passed uh, a few years earlier when, the, when this was uh, tried. This is a new addition uh, strengthened by Madame Monique Bajan. Portability is, is, is there has to be a maximum of three months beyond which it's not allowed that the residency of someone going to another province or another part of the country shall be insured. It does not mean that when the resident, the eligible insured person leaves his or her province, she still remains covered by the previous province or, uh, or territory. But nonetheless, they will start to say that uh, no more than six, uh, three months of waiting period. In addition, the provinces and territories are uh, enjoined by the federal government to ensure that the, the, the requirements relating to payments for insured health services are done in advance and delineated before this, any complaints happen. So those are the five criteria, portability, accessibility, uh, non-profit uh, non public administration, and uh, comprehensiveness and universality. And uh, as a final slide to this uh, situation, the federal government acts through the Canada Health Act and then delivers the message to the provincial and territorial governments. Note that the arrow is this way. 
And the reason this is, is because the, the healthcare delivery is an exclusive property under the Constitution of Canada, solely by the provinces and territories, except for certain defined uh, exceptions, like members of the armed forces, federal inmates, and so on. But by and large, healthcare delivery is the exclusive jurisdiction of the provincial and territorial government. Where the federal government has assumed a role and a significant role is by using the federal spending power, by opening a budget, a, a part of the total budget as part of the contribution of the federal government. And that is why there is this Canada health transfer. And that is how the system works. During the time of negotiation, almost, almost every 10 years, the federal minister of health and the minister of health from the various provinces and territories would have a series of conferences. When the, when the negotiation is concluded and they have an agreed upon uh, terms of agreement, the first ministers, the prime minister and the ministers of all the provinces and the leaders of the three territories will convene and make the big announcement. So what is crucial here to remember is this, there has always been an accord reached despite the sometimes very, very disconcerting public debate. So this is how our Canada's medical system at the moment operates. I'd just like to say at this point in concluding this component of my presentation, that the funding principle for Canada's Medicare is really a sociological principle. And that is that you can access the healthcare system irrespective of your ability to pay. You do not need a credit card. You just get that care. Because the Canadian public has believed that it is a public good. And in the various presentations and debates that I've had on the issue, I have called it as the grand jewel of all social programs. It is the most decentralized system. It is decentralized to all the 10 provinces and three territories. The federal government does not participate except for the jurisdiction it has over uh, veterans and uh, members of the armed forces. So healthcare delivery is the preview, uh, the purview of the, of, the, of the provinces and territorial governments. Again, to emphasize and underscore single payer, non-profit, public authority accountable to the government and therefore to the people to the elective process is a, is a key component of the criteria that uh, govern uh, Medicare. It is understood and it's an interesting review by the National Institute of Health USA that uh, it says that unless there is a renewal of the, of the social contract between the governments, the providers of care and the, and the public that there is a threat to the survival of, of Medicare. I don't think uh, it will come to that. It will continue to survive. And so in fact, the same review uh, indicates that it may be a potential global model. And that is why earlier at the beginning, I was alluding to whether Dr. Just could potentially see uh, and apply data science and how we can sort of improve even better the, the Canada's uh, healthcare system. And that is, I will pause there. Uh, and then later on, I will cover this uh, aspect of politics, which I say is also a noble calling. And uh, for this part, I will have no slides. And uh, this is a result of my wife, after I rehearsed the slides to her last night, said something is missing. And I said, okay, I will add this one. And I will share this with you later on. I will post here and perhaps invite uh, the questions and answers that uh, Dr. Silverio Cabellion and Dr. Herrera would like to guide us now through. Thank you at this point. Thank you, Dr. Patan. Now uh, I see, I see uh, Dr. Herrera is here. But before Dr. Herrera takes on the podium and fields the questions, yeah, how can in I, the audience, I can in the audience you. is Chancellor Michael T. Just, of UP Manila. Yeah, just a second. In I, the audience I, is I lost, Dean I lost. Charlotte. Shung. I lost the visual. Yeah. And in the audience 
is uh, also the president of uh, UPMASA. So there they are paying attention to this uh, uh, inter interaction. Thank you for joining us, distinguished leaders in health uh, care. I also see some uh, Dr. Datok, Dr. Bong Yogore are here. So uh, Dr. Herrera, ma'am, oh. your, your floor. Dr. Herrera? Yes. And Dr. Um, Bellion? I have having uh, just again. I called my son. I cannot get the the screen, the picture. Okay. Just, just a moment, please. Yeah. Uh, let's turn off your screen share. <coughs> In the meantime, are there any questions from the audience? If you could just uh, put a your hand, raise your hand, so that I'll know who to call. Thank you. Um, well, if there are no questions yet, let me uh, ask one question. Dr. Ray, um, Canadian Medicare system is province specific. Is that not correct? You have the criterion for universality and accessibility. And yet I think from reading about it, that it is province specific, that if you are in one province, you cannot get health care if you're traveling in a, another province of Canada. Is that correct? No, we can travel in any province. We can get health care in so in long as province. they, in every, it, 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 because there is a, a mobility right under the Canadian constitution, and therefore anybody can go anywhere. And if you get sick or ill and needs Medicare, you can get that Medicare in that province, and that province will be reimbursed by your own provincial authority. Okay, well, that's good to know because that's not the available um, online information, um, which probably well, needs to be correct. There's difficulty because a province may have a different fee schedule, and that is why they will continue to have the debate. Okay, well, they try to make it as much as possible the same, but uh, they are covered by the province before they become fully eligible in the province and they have only up to three months at that time the province where the where the resident begins to settle permanently must have approved their uh, residency eligibility at that point uh, so the but the cost will be reimbursed okay um if there are no other questions i will ask yeah, my second. i do have a question i do have a question uh as you know, sir, the, uh, the uh, uh, Philippines has just uh, passed the Universal Health Care Act. And uh, the presence of uh, Chancellor T kind of puts a little underlining here because they're trying to, to implement the act. The Philippines, as you may probably know, uh, about several years ago, started the Bill Health System as the national insurance system. But I believe there is still some private insurance that are happening here. So my question is, what can the Philippines learn from Canada in, their, in trying to be successful in trying to implement uh, the Universal Health Care Act in the Philippines? What, what, what would be something that the Philippines should be looking at to see if they can uh, be as successful as Canada? Yes, it's a, the question is very crucial and has to be asked. It is not easy. For one thing, we have to study this, the, the attitude of the government, the attitude of the provinces that uh, we have so many in the country, and the levels of income of each of the provinces to support this. So they have to come to a conclusion as to who will do the total budgeting. Now, I understand it. In the Philippines, there is no exclusivity, exclusivity in terms of who deliver health care that may make it easier in so long as they have the cooperation of all the provinces. 
and uh, and uh, with the with the national government. Now, what I am not so clear now is who has the taxation power in the Philippines? Is it solely the federal, or do provinces impose taxes as well? Because the source of funding for our system in Canada is the is the public taxation. So. Obviously, I cannot answer the question because I have to know all those factors. What I would say, though, is this. With the field, health, with the field insurance before that uh, my classmate, Dr. Singson, held a symposium at the Jonelta Foundation of School of Medicine about 10 years ago in 2011, and, they, and a resource person came from the field health insurance uh, body, what I noticed was that there was an increase in the use of the system. So when I pose the question, how many of those who are at the lower category of income have used the system, and how many are those of the higher level of income have used the system because of the need for co-payment? The data show that the, usage, the, the increased usage of the system has come from those with higher income. So to me, it is uh, not quite the intent of the app because in that system, if that trend would continue, then the, the the lower income people will be subsidizing the higher income people because they cannot afford to have the, the co-payments and therefore they're not utilizing the insurance system. Back to your question, could it learn? I hope we can share information. Certainly it's worth exploring because even the, uh, the UK, USA, uh, USA, Canada, Italy, Germany, uh, of the three countries, about in 2009 held a, a comparison of their healthcare systems, and it was sponsored by the Royal College of Physicians in London. And I happened to represent the Minister of Health in that conference. So a similar conference could be held uh, under the sponsorship of one body uh, who has an interest on the issue and a lot of expertise. Now, with the expertise that I have read about uh, from Dr. Santos, for example, very good in technology and the advances, and I think from Dr. Herrera's group, if we can put together some of these things, I am sure it will. Uh, it could only help, I, I would say. It could only help, but it has to be done. If that process has to be pursued from my background in politics, then I think approaching the Canadian Embassy for some support for that through the SIDA program planning mission may be an avenue to pursue. Hmm. Okay. Um, that's very interesting, Dr. Ray. Um, Dr. Juice had a question. Dr. Santos, Juice Santos, you had a question? Um, yeah, it's very similar to the question by Dr. Billy Cabellion, but I typed it before you, you spoke up. So uh, I'll just read it, uh, read what I wrote on the screen. Um, so basically, you have um, essentially answered the question, but I'd like you to compare, um, for example, uh, Obamacare with um, when when you mentioned the 2009 Obamacare was not in existence yet. So now, um, can you um, educate us on what makes Canada Healthcare better or worse than Obamacare? Um, you've already answered the second part of my question is with, with in which I I asked uh, what would um, Philippine uh, policymakers could do to get even close to um, like Canada or Italy or American healthcare, which is uh, universal uh, regardless of uh, what uh, uh, class or status you are in the society. Participation of the providers of healthcare, the physicians in particular, must show a real cooperation into the system because they are the they are the, a, a major source of costs in addition to the pharmaceutical companies that uh, do have a lot of profit from the prescription drugs. So, unless those two major stakeholders in the healthcare delivery system are involved then we may not be able to achieve because the cost of the, the healthcare cost expenditure is much higher with any other system than the non than the nonprofit system under the public authority in Canada. I think uh, ideal as it may be from my point of view, it is not easy because then you have to have to face that particular medical lobby 
And uh, I knew that because we faced it in Canada. The grocers went on strike. I myself refused to renew my membership. I could not believe that in 1971-72, and I said, I could not believe that they will not agree. I must add, however, that today, the Canadian Medical Association is one of the strongest supporters of Canada's Medicaid. So it, it can happen, but it takes time. Um, let's assume, um, Dr. Ray, that funding, or in the Philippines, let's assume that funding is not an issue for now. What lessons would you advise the Philippines as they set up this universal care are the key elements for universal care? So you say it's the medically necessary care. What about care for disabled children, for example? Is that considered medically necessary? You know, the disability support? Um, what about integrating medical education with the healthcare system or the nurses, for example, all the different professions. What would you advise? I, you know, we can't solve funding for now. I mean, that has to be solved. But in terms of the elements, in other words, what would you think are important? And what lessons, as Billy said, should have been done from the beginning rather than come in after? Well, certainly, you, you mentioned factors that uh, people with disability are very crucial. Uh, even in Canada. Uh, if the group will, uh, are fully uh, covered because they're they and, and they need whatever system it is in terms of system. Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah. So this was sort of my comments to that uh, question. So what shall be you know, there shall be a consultation among the potential stakeholders in the country before they apply. But I think they have to accept the file that it can come by sort of. Uh, in a gradual basis. It cannot be done overnight for all the services. I don't think any country can possibly afford that. So we have to be realistic and have a consensus on the priorities that we will place one ahead of the other. Okay. Billy, you have another question? Oh, yes, ma'am. I do have a question. You know, you mga kamag-anak ko sa Pilipinas, if you have really understand, this Tagalog. Every time they get sick, they don't call Bill Health. They call Billy Cabellion. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, sabi ko, nung nangyayari dito, <laughs> kala ko may Bill Health. Sabi naman nila, mga nung, Bill Health 20% or something like that. And uh, I actually invited the Secretary Arbosa to, to join us, uh, but he may be busy, but uh, Chancellor T is here and uh, Dean Charlotte Chong is, is here. My, my question is uh, actually two. One, uh, you know, you, we, we cannot pay for everything that a patient needs, like we can't uh, pay for the plastic surgery that somebody wants but we do have to pay for somebody that uh, has uh, chronic uh, kidney uh, disease. So the first question is, how did you define your list of insured benefits? That's one. How did you define that? And what are the parameters for this? Because I'm sure the Philippines cannot afford everything and they had to define what would be their insured benefits from the very beginning. So that's one. The, question, the other question is, how did you define how much tax you are going to tax the people in order to come to a certain level of financing 
your insured benefits because you cannot, we have to pay for our submarines that the Philippines is going to buy and we can't even afford that. Kaya marami tayong gastos. So those are the two questions, sir. And uh, 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 and how did you how did you come to a balance with those needs on one hand and the other? We do the same balancing in Canada because there is a limit. There is a level of taxation. So that's that's a given. And I guess the political leaders of the day uh, have just to to know that. And it's not it's easier said than done, but certainly uh, the level of taxation. But when you speak of taxation, there is the continuing debate of how much will the big businesses pay and how much will the citizens uh, without businesses pay. So any system that is adopted, but is what should be a progressive system. And my belief, at least this is part of my political philosophy, is that the more you have, the more you have to pay even as a percent of your total income and not the absolute amount. Because looking at the absolute amount can be a drop in the bucket in your total income. And your total income, we know, because you're in business likely, will be a good number, will be tax deductible on a good level of amenities that you have. So I think society and the people in that levels of income must also uh, recognize and acknowledge that. And I think with good political leadership, that can be forthcoming, not easy, but it can be forthcoming. Now, on the question of what will be insured, I think you were referring to who will define the medical necessities that, that have to be insured. And I alluded to that in Canada, we have not defined that, but they all agree that whatever you provide as doctors in the hospital, necessary for the care of the patients, not the fringe benefits, not the television, but the required for your healthcare, Will be insured and there has not been any debate and there is no formal definition and whatever the hospital will provide to this patient care must be insured again it is not specified whether you must have this kind of luxuries or what have you i think from the experience of canada it is best not defined because then upon definition then you will be a source of interpretation and conflict that uh, money and effort will be lost based on the on the goodwill of the providers, the physicians, the nurses, and the hospital administrators, I, from the experience of Canada, I would leave it undefined because after 40 years of experience with the Canada Medicare, we have had no problem and it has not been defined. That's why I alluded to that in my earlier presentation. On your initial comment, I would just like to add my comment. It is interesting. When I started uh, after high school, I knew I would find a day job and go to a night school studying law, perhaps journalism as an option. My mother said, when we get sick, we get poorer. We would like you to become a doctor. And my dad said, my tata, oh, you will go to UP, the best medical school and the cheapest tuition fee. And that's why I ended in UP, right? So it was not within my dream that I would be a medical doctor. And I think then I asked my, mo my mother, I asked them, how can you possibly support me? And her answer was simple, with the grace of God. So the grace of God has still kept me alive until now. That's great. Um, that's wonderful. Dean Chong, do you have a question? I see you. <laughs> yeah, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's really a very interesting talk. Uh, Dr. Ray Pagtaghan, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation. Um, it's a uh, utopian dream for us to have uh, a really working universal health care. I've talked to some officials of the World Bank and they grabbed in my shoulders, told me that the Philippines cannot afford it if we, if we actually uh, maintain the, the kind of health care delivery that we're doing now. So it will take a revolution. I think we need to be able to find a good balance as to what our doctors should be able to provide and what can be provided by other uh, healthcare workers. There's an ongoing conversation now with the Department of Health, so I'm actually late for that meeting because I would like to listen to you. But uh, it's interesting, um, the five aspects that you mentioned. I think that, um, yes, it's true that we need to be able to provide universal access. And my experience for hearing health is the same. 
uh, I advocated for universal newborn hearing screening in 2007. It became a law in 2009. So there's universal newborn hearing screening that can be paid for by PhilHealth. And just about four years ago, we had the PhilHealth provision for hearing aids for children with disabilities with respect to hearing. And that pilot hospital is PGH. So we are now able to provide a free hearing aids and speech therapy services for hearing impaired children at PGH. And hopefully that will be a model for the whole country. And just about three years ago during the pandemic, we launched a national cochlear implant program where we are able to provide free cochlear implants to children who will not benefit from hearing aids. So I believe that uh, pockets of care like this, uh, different uh, services can be packaged as such, but it was a very difficult and challenging proposition in the first place. Initially, the OAC didn't want to support universal newborn hearing screening. Then they said, they said that we cannot afford it because Philippines is poor. So I had to, I had to get some experts in health economics to help me out cost out what is the cost of having a child who's deaf and cannot contribute to society and we and we told government that if you provide the appropriate service you'll be saving four million pesos so even if you provide a cochlear implant that will cost one million pesos you still have a savings of three million per deaf child where you provide the services so i think that kind of um the studies that will be needed, the data that will be needed to support those uh, kind of uh, debates and uh, questions should be should be promoted in all the services. Because in the end, I think what will come out is really health is the prime mover of society. That everything revolves around having a healthy population, medical education, all the things that we do will have to redound to have a healthy nation. And I think. We've been lost in the trap of uh, innovation, maybe even uh, advances, but in the end, it's really how can we promote health for an individual in society? And I think I, I trained in Canada, so I know the healthcare system. I was there for a year uh, training in, in, in neurotology and skull based surgery. So I, I believe that it's an aspiration for the Philippines to follow perhaps the Canadian model uh, so that we are able to save on healthcare costs. So I'd like to just uh, comment that perhaps uh, you can uh, you can help us uh, try to reach CEDA, uh, the International Development uh, Association of Canada, to be able to start conversations as to how maybe the Philippines can learn from the lessons from Canada. And with you there, I believe that this will happen. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'll do my best. I'm out of government now, but uh, certainly I can make some uh, references. And it is vital because after all, diseases, uh, no, no geographic <laughs> boundaries. And we know that with the recent pandemic that we had, so I think uh, there is a cause to, that can be made, a case that can be made, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dean Chung. Excellent. Um, Dr. Aranda, or do you have a question, sir? I, I have a, um, a follow-up on what the previous speaker was saying because uh, despite all the wealth of, of the United States, where I am now, I work in New York at the moment, I moved from McGill. So I worked for 20 some years in Canada and about 20. The rate of the United States is much, much worse than uh, Canada, or it's not as good as Canada. So what the previous speaker was saying is that if you target certain population or certain items or certain diseases like newborn screening, you probably can slowly uh, go into a successful model where a new gradually move towards uh, increasing the number of um, medical apps are provided by the government. But I don't think you can do right at the very beginning what Canada has. Believe me, I was a, a fellow at McGill when this problem was um, uh, um, was uh, started. And all my attendings went on strike one to, <laughs> a few months uh, to the um, uh, 
tremendous difficulty of all the residents and, and the fellows who have to take over some of the medical jobs that, that the attendings did not want to do. So it, it was really quite difficult. But I think it's probably slowly that you can bring this, not the way that Canada has started. Uh, the one thing that was very interesting with the Canadian system was that I remember in Quebec, uh, during the early phase of the um, of the Medicare um, uh, um, uh, period, when it was introduced, uh, the uh, taxes, the, uh, the provincial tax went very high up. And they were making a lot of money, so that a uh, jury uh, they were the the Medicare system was even offering grants for uh, to, uh, to improve uh, delivery of healthcare, not for science, but delivery of healthcare. Uh, and then it gradually had more problems uh, thereafter. And I I I left the United the Canada and came to the United States, so I don't know what all the other issues are. Uh, so that may be one way of doing it uh, is what you were saying. You can get a universal uh, screening program for newborns. You can improve the health care of mothers who are delivering their babies. Uh, start somewhere uh, and provide those care. And maybe that is where you can... Um, uh, uh, you can convince the government uh, that uh, that by doing some of these things, that ultimately uh, they will um, spend less money. I think the Canadian system is uh, showing that that with some of the preventive care that they're saying that they're doing, there there are much less morbidities. It's actually, yes. a great point. Um, yes, Doctor Ray. Yes, there is one uh, recent, or when I say recent, about four or five years ago. But in fact, on that very point, that the trust, one trust recommended is this preventive health aspect of uh, of the practice of medicine. In other words, improving uh, public health. Uh, during my time, and that's now more than 50 years ago, the Puri Cultural Centers was really in this array. So much so that I, considering public health at one time, was discouraged. It was it was not there, and so that is one part. If the system has not changed. I don't think it has significantly changed. That has to be looked into the aspect of uh, public health in the country. It's a, uh, and public health is a very strong relationship with the Johns Hopkins University. And so again, the thing can be tough. Uh, and uh, certainly in the forefront uh, in terms of uh, preventive prevention is very crucial, particularly in a country when infectious diseases are, uh, are far uh, forefront than uh, anywhere else. So I cannot agree more with you. Yeah. Uh, Ray, I have a question for you. Could you comment on the, the um, applicability or effectiveness of all the five criteria or the five um, essences of uh, the Canadian system? Uh, for instance, accessibility is a big issue. Um, uh, comprehensiveness is good. Um, Universality is good, uh, but there are some components of that that are not uh, properly or not well applied. So what particular component am I hearing you? Ac please? Accessibility. There are yes. many patients there who cannot access. Yes, the kind of as I alluded to in the Canadian requirement, when we look at accessibility, it must be done on uniform forms, meaning to, to ensure that the level of income is not a hindrance also, that user fees and extra charges once an insurance plan is put in place will not be added on by the providers of care. And the second point is the distance, because that certainly creates a problem of access. Okay. So those things are taken into account. And uh, in Canada, I must, I must share, we still have a lot of disparities in healthcare when we look at our First Nations mm -hmm. people who, look, who live in the reserve. And in fact, it is the consensus that unless we solve that, uh, we're really headed for trouble. And uh, so in the 1993 or 95, 96 budget of the Canadian federal government, when all departments had to reduce their costs, the only department that was exempted were the department for the Aboriginal people. To, to indicate that we had called the priorities, they cannot be re reduced. And so there is a call up for priorities. So accessibility certainly is a, it's a very vital issue. 
in any healthcare uh, system that will be introduced. But what is it in the Philippines in terms of, do we have enough, uh, let me ask, do we have enough uh, providers of healthcare that are there in the Philippines? I would assume we have because we can afford to, to recruit some to North America. So we have the doctors, the nurses, and et cetera. And as alluded to earlier by the earlier speaker, uh, getting them to involve in the delivery of healthcare at given level, I think is in order. Even in Canada, we have now the so-called physician assistants that uh, have a level of course for say a certain period of time, indigenous in Canada, and then they're helping all the doctors. So the healthcare resources are increased without significantly adding or imposing a burden on the physicians themselves. The foreign medical graduates who have yet not been accredited do follow the same system they are called clinical assistants. My difficulty with that system from the point of view of immigration, to me, it was it is a legislated uh, discrimination because there is no pathway of graduation from that particular system. But the immigrants are happy, they're getting a good income, but the sense of being fully fulfilled as a physician is not being attained. So that, that requires another level of political leadership in Canada. But the same model though can be, uh, can be studied by the Philippines in, in a concerted fashion as the system is now being introduced in the country. Sure. Those are all great points. Um, uh, actually, the level starting with universal maternal and neonatal care could be one that could be first done, especially for the value of preventive medicine. Maybe compare that with how they will age and compare it to the current seniors and their health um, status would give the economic data that Dean Chong was talking about to justify the Philippine government funding everything. Um, Billy, you, okay. we can go on and on with this. This is like really excellent. Yeah, we, can, um, we can really get along, but this is very interesting. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, the next segment, maybe, of uh, what Dr. Uh, Pagtahan would say, you know, politics is not a very welcome oh. word. Dr. Kennedy, why did you go to politics? And Senator Kennedy says, politics is a chance for you to change society. You are at the level where we're talking tonight about medicine. So it is lawmakers like Dr. Pagtakhan, who takes about 20 years or so to get a Medicare program where politics, if you take it at a higher level, plays a role on whether you're going to live 30 years <coughs> or 130 years. <laughs> Sir, can you tell me how you did as a lawmaker to make me live 130 years with your Medicare program. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> I, 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 I hope I knew, you know. But I may interrupt. I saw the name of Jack Aranda. Is it Aranda? Yeah. Jake Aranda? Aranda. Where's Dr. Aranda from? He Sir? To, yeah, he, he used to be head of at McGill of the Newborn Service and also oh. a good friend. The name is here. Yes, he yes. asked you a question. <laughs> Did I ask you a question? Huh? Uh, we we I I met uh, Dr. Pagdakan when we oh, got. Oh, Jake, my my eyes are not so good. Okay, I need vision <laughs> care. Jake, it's been a time. Good, good, yeah, good to see you. <laughs> yeah, I've been what, wondering. Where are you based? I've been, uh, my, my I've been wondering where you, you are. Where are I, you based now, Jake? 
New York. I, I'm working in New York now. I'm the director of neonatology at um, the State yeah. University of New York downstate. So I, I moved to um, <laughs> where I could really work um, simultaneously in Canada and in Michigan. Yeah. Uh, they offered me to um, to um, build a, um, um, a, a pediatric uh, research center in uh, Children's Hospital of Michigan, Wayne State. And so I went there and got the NIH to have the network. So I worked mm -hmm. in Detroit. And on weekends, I work in Ontario, Canada. Oh, uh, you. Windsor. Ah. Uh, the just crossing the river. Oh, wow. In 20 minutes, I'm Canadian again. So yeah, it was good. quite a wonderful idea. And uh, now I'm in New York. Uh, I, I I ran an NIH network here. Yeah. Dr. Oranda was a Queen Elizabeth scientist in Canada. And my boss was the Queen Elizabeth scientist, not this one, but I worked with Dr. Chernick. But so, Jake, uh, you, you may know, studied the, the, the efficacy of caffeine in the newborn. Is that still true, Jake? It is true. And uh, it is now we uh, we got awarded that from the <clears throat> the American Academy of Pediatrics as the landmark work coming from Canada actually, uh, because that was a Canadian uh, discovery, and it has improved the outcomes up to ten years of newborn babies uh, given that in the newborn period, and one of the reasons why I sent. Um, I think Dr. Ui or something like that from at UP. Uh, and um, uh, Dr. Um, Vivina Chu at uh, Cebu, uh, uh, bottles of caffeine is for them to start working on those in the Philippines. Yes. And it, it never went, uh, worked uh, very well, so. You, you know, Jake, I, I apologize for the interruption because I've been trying to get in touch with Jay for sometimes if I could. There was a time when I was still a that, uh, humble student here. And at one time, when all my bosses were out of town, uh, but for about two weeks, I played with some rats and I was missing them, getting the surface tension. And I I proved that uh, the if I remove the adrenals, they do not work, you know? <laughs> so we got, that was before the discovery of, this, of the role of cortisols on, uh, wow. on the surfactant synthesis. And you know what? I submitted the abstract. It was accepted with the Canadian Thoracic Society. My boss was afraid said, Ray, there is no basis for this idea. Oh, well, it was a chance discovery. God, that's how stress played, you know. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so I missed the opportunity two years earlier than the synthesis of, uh, of surfactant, you know, related to the cortical. Oh, yeah, that, that's So you one. can stumble on it. I still have the my tracing on that. I still have on the well, you, balance tracing. You're talking about uh, Victor Chernik? Yes, Vic, yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, I I miss him every now and then. I still see him. I, he I was the first. Him. He yeah, was the first say. fellow of my uh, my mentor, uh, Mary Ellen Avery, who became the yeah. first woman professor and chair at Harvard in pediatrics. Yes. First woman um, physician pediatrician in chief at Boston Children's Hospital. Yes, she was my boss, um, huh? Dean Chung. Um, you were gonna you say something else. So I was saying that uh, if there's a study that you'd like to be able to do here at the UP College of Medicine, uh, please uh, feel free to contact us. I, uh, we have a lot of uh, scientists and young MD-PhD students who are really just uh, raring to have all these different projects uh, go on. So please uh, contact me if there's any project that might be of interest. Uh, I will make sure that we, we do give you the scientists that will work on these projects. Yeah, we have a lot of projects, particularly uh, with some of these uh, new drugs that we are developing for newborns. They are actually all drugs that we are tr trying to figure out how best that we could use them. Uh, the problem is that uh, we have difficulty contacting you. Or, uh, how do we contact uh, you there? I have my email uh, cmchong at up.edu.ph. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that one out. Yeah. 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 We'll make sure you have it, Dr. Aranda. Right. Um, uh, Billy, do you want to continue the questions or you want Dr. Santos? No more, no more, no more. Uh, I'm looking Close forward to, to the comments Sanchez. of Dr. Paktakhan on politics. And then we will follow with the closing remarks of my co-hosts for this webinar series on health medicine. 
Uh, sir, yeah. your, Dr. Pagtaghan, your comments on your political career this time. How much do I still have time for that? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I was rehearsing my slides with my wife, my first critic, and she thought it was dry on Medicare alone. So she said, you have to include a few of what you had done in parliament. I go, where do I start? She said, well, it's not about the uh, compensation for the hemophiliac patients who received HIV tainted blood. She remembers that. But then Dr. Santiago, I just said about that in the, uh, in the introduction. Perhaps I should start, uh, it will be sort of uh, ad lib and you can comment. But the, the greatest feeling of fulfillment I had in parliament is that when I succeeded in bringing to the country two Filipina deportees on conversation with the Minister of Immigration, one when I was in opposition and the other when I was in government. And the one in the opposition, the case she was, she, mis she, she, she lied about her marital status. The, her lawyers argued the most and she had one of the best lawyers in the country. Unfortunately, she lost the case, she lost the appeal and she was deported. So then a community member approached me and said, what can be done? So since I am not a lawyer, my only approach is to appeal to the minister on humanitarian basis and uh, find out does she have a true remorse? Has she learned from the mistake that she had? And in what status of living does she, was she now? I was, I'm in Canada, she was in the Philippines. So how could it be? I would never represent anybody without having talked to the person. Fortunately, at about three or four weeks later, I had a schedule to be in Manila. I interviewed her and what struck me was when I asked her, do you have a child? And she said, yes. And said, shall I report about it? I said, you have to, okay, you, can, you can hide it if you like, but you can never get your child again ever in Canada if you return yourself. Oh yes, I will. So I used that as a force as a measure of her true remorse. But when I, tell, when I told the minister back to, in Ottawa, oh, Ray, I mean, she has a child? <laughs> yes. But then I told the minister, Madam Minister, it is a good sign. She is now having a deep remorse. To make the long story, she was allowed to return to Canada. And the other one is a, is a pregnancy to it. This one was about to be deported. She had lived together with her fiance as a pimple bride for about 55 days. The visa, the, the fiance visa was to expire in 60 days. So she had only five days. She went to a lawyer uh, uh, advised to file an asylum uh, uh, claim that of course lost uh, to appeal the case. She approached me at that time. I said, well, your chances of really winning the case on appeal are almost nil. And but consult with your lawyer, I am not. And uh, if he gives you a chance, but don't accept the word you have a chance. Say is it 50%, 25%, 5% or 0%. Otherwise anybody has a chance. And so she came back, she has no chance. <laughs> and why spend another cost? So at that point, I took up the case and humanitarian ground, I, I argued with the minister. But I remember one note, the minister at the time, Barbara McDougall, also a wo the woman, the minister responsible for, women, for, the, for the status of women in Canada. So I remember the, the, the last note in my covering letter said, Madam Minister, may your responsibility for women extend beyond the women of Canada to the women <laughs> of the world. I think it touched her heart. She allowed her to stay. So I, I, I thought of that as sort of a one-to-one, -one, it's a real fulfilling experience because you're able to make a difference in the life of a citizen or the life of a person. Another one was beyond our province in Edmonton. She was a living caregiver and the same thing, you know, she would hide in the church. The priest would call me and said, you know, she cannot be arrested in the basement of my church under the Geneva Convention. And I told the priest, I said, Father, I will not debate that issue, but tell me, are you prepared to take care of her in the basement of the church for the rest of her life? I said, that's cruel, because it's not cruel, Father. That is the reality. And now you are a betting lying because she lied. Okay. This other, the second woman, uh, or the, in this instance, the third. And so anyway, he said, 
if she goes home, I will help her return. Do you promise? So I, can, I am not the one making a decision. I'm only making a representation, so I cannot promise. I, I will promise my effort. Well, to make the long story short, uh, eventually the priest could, uh, advised her to go home. And about four months later, another minister, this time I was in government, so I could talk to her more frequently, the minister, and she allowed her to return. So sort of those kind of individual cases. But in terms of the other aspects of politics, there are really a lot of opportunities. For example, when the wellness, when the Seven Oaks General Hospital uh, uh, approached me for a with a proposal to establish a wellness center, in other words, a new facility that will now see the whole compound expanding from acute care, chronic care, rehabilitation, and even sort of uh, restoration of, uh, of, of, of good health. And I only added to its proposal that it could agree to also pursue research in the field. Well, uh, it came about July of that year. By, by November, we were announcing the funding. And two years later, the Wellness Institute uh, was opened. So again, that kind of uh, opportunity. The Philippine Center was established. The other thing is that there was a file where the, ab the Aboriginal veterans, for example, had been neglected by the governments, by previous federal governments. When I became minister and I look at this uh, report gathering dust, so I asked the deputy minister, what can be done? So it so happened that a particular weekend, about two weeks after my appointment in January, I got a call from the minister's uh, executive assistant telling if I could proceed to the prime minister's residence. So something was, uh, was to happen. A, a minister had resigned, so there will be a shuffle. I was given a new assignment. While waiting in the prime minister's residence, he asked me, what's new in your department, Ray? Oh, oh yes, prime minister, I need some funding for the Aboriginal veterans. And then he said, that's always the problem with you. You're always asking more money. So I said, prime minister, I take it as a go. And uh, so leave it with me. I'll talk to your principal secretary. Well, to make the long story short, that was January. By May, I was announcing the package of 39 million. I requested 40 million. He subtracted 1 million. So that's OK. So 39 million, we were able to pay the Aboriginal veterans. Really issues that uh, you know, to relate to the fairness of government. Why would a particular sector be deprived only because they, they do not know uh, much about the, the issue. And one last component of the former Minister of Veterans Affairs was the former prisoners of war. Two or three of them had been complaining in the public for several weeks or months because they missed the deadline with which, when, which to apply. The law had been repealed, so there is no more governing law to grant the benefits. So previous ministers could not uh, did not have the opportunity to solve the problem. When my time came, I asked my deputy, do you have a cut list of the former prisoners of war that you can verify the claim for, for benefits? He said, oh, yes. And I said, do, do we have a record that they had been written to? So we check, none. And there are 17 more, or a to, total of 17, who had not received benefits. So I asked the deputy minister, I said, what do I have? Well, minister, you can uh, invoke as the ex gratia principle. So well, I have just invoked it. So we pay the 17 former prisoners of war their compensation, 20,000 each. Little things that one can do, and uh, but sometimes can be neglected in the work of a member of parliament or a minister just because of how busy they are. So I had the opportunity and privilege to have some of them, you know. So these are some of the things. In two or three, for example, after the first episode of SARS, which reached Toronto, that really bothered me. And so when the G8, the G8 science ministers at that time, Russia was still included in Berlin, when I went for the, my first meeting of the science ministers at the time, I presented on the threat of infectious diseases. So there were so many opportunities that one can have and, and do good in parliament. So I would really encourage uh, uh, colleagues, if the opportunity arrives, to consider a career in politics. As has been alluded to, uh, politics will be with us forever. 
at the same time, I know that politics uh, are only one level, uh, the politicians are only one level higher than murderers and thieves, whereas physicians, <laughs> we are only one level below the ministers of the faith. So how to change? But I think we can challenge ourselves when the opportunity comes to really accept it. And I think, uh, as I remember saying at one time, uh, when the opportunity was there, that we should continue healing beyond the, the boundaries of, of, of medicine. So those are some Thank of the things that I just like to share very briefly. If you have any more questions, I would be glad to, to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, the last segment of our uh, fireside chat tonight uh, will be handled by Dr. Uh, Santos. Dr. Santos is my neighbor here in Washington, <laughs> D.C. He is professor at the George Washington. I don't know, Jose, ito mga doktor nagsasalita ngayong gabi. Eh. Ano bang perspective mo sa mga pinapag-usapan na namin ngayong gabi? From a scientist, and Jose also is a board director of the Philippine American Academy for Science and Engineering. So, sir, will you give us your perspective of what you heard tonight? Um, Thank you. Uh, we would like to uh, acknowledge, uh, first and foremost, Dr. Ray Pagtakhan for such an engaging talk on the synergy between medicine and politics. I'm sure everybody here myself included, were inspired and learned a great deal from the knowledge and experience of Dr. Pagtakhan on the essence of medicine and its importance in the domain of policy and politics. Uh, thanks also to my colleague, Dr. Billy Cabellion and Dr. Victoria Herrera for organizing and moderating this fireside chat, as well as Dr. Fe Santiago for doing the introduction for Dr. Pagtakhan's impressive track record of accomplishments. And of course, to the ever-reliable February for making the program run smoothly for this event, as well as the past and subsequent Paase meetings and webinars, which uh, I encourage everybody to attend. So once again, we are very grateful to Dr. Pagtakhan for showing his invaluable, for sharing his invaluable uh, insights on the intersection and synergy of medicine and politics. Your words of wisdom encourage and motivate us to follow your great examples, perhaps uh, pursue, uh, as what you said, um, a career in politics. Your words of wisdom encourage and motivate us. And uh, also, um, we're um, inspired to uh, proactively contribute to the Philippines uh, in the countries where we reside now and as well as the global economy by leveraging our own unique skills and capabilities. It is personally music to my ears when you mentioned the important role of data science to enhance the delivery of healthcare to the public using the five criteria that you uh, mentioned in your slide, namely um, public administration, comprehensive, universal, accessible, and portable. May I request uh, February to show on the screen our certificate of appreciation for Dr. Pagtakhan? So I'd like um, to read uh, what the certificate says. So certificate of appreciation from PAASE, Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering. Uh, appreciation. Uh, this certificate uh, is proudly presented to Dr. Ray Pagtakhan with uh, all the multiple uh, designations here that um, that uh, was introduced uh, when we were beginning this uh, fireside uh, for graciously sharing his expertise in his talk entitled Medicina at Politica during the Paase Fireside Chat Series given this 22nd day of March 2024. And um, it's signed by Pro President Gladys Completo who uh, I uh, apologize earlier because of a conflict she couldn't make it to tonight, tonight's uh, fireside chat. Um, again, let us applaud Dr. Pagtakhan. And I think everyone here deserves uh, a pat on the back for an undeniably, undeniably successful event. 
Um, Thank good you night so to everyone yeah. in the US and Canada, and good morning and happy Friday in the Philippines. Um, Dr. Pagtakan, thank, thank you so yeah. much. From the bottom of my heart, uh, personally, as probably the non-doctor here, I, I'm a doctor but a fake doctor, <laughs> but I truly appreciate the uh, the huge respect that I have for doctors like you, and uh, more so for you for contributing significantly uh, in the delivery of um, accessible, comprehensive, universal, portable health care to Canada. And, and I hope that this serves as a lesson for both the uh, United States and especially the Philippines to follow your great examples. Truly inspiring stories. Uh, I'll, I'll remember the $39 million. <laughs> That's so inspiring. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Just, And uh, certainly, I feel honored and I feel humbled. I, I continue to learn. Thank you. Okay. All right. Actually, that was not going to be the last word. I'm going to invite the president of OPMASA to say a few words and really honored for him to be present. President Henry, sir, you have the last word before we say goodbye tonight. Oh my gosh, uh, this is a topic that, that that's quite uh, difficult to tackle, medicine and politics and and economics, if I were to add a third one, because I think that that pretty much uh, there was one word that sort of resonated in, um, uh, in this uh, 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 topic. Uh, it kept being repeated by Dr. Pagtakan, which is taxation, taxation, taxation. And it just stresses the fact that good health care needs money. And um, in the United States, it's sad to say that some patients may not even af afford to pay their copay despite their insurance for their medication or for their tests. Um, I have Canadian and UK patients who come to the United States to have their test expedited, bringing a credit card of a relative to pay for the services. Um, in the Philippines, not too long ago, a colleague of ours, a classmate, my wife actually, decided to, to, to stop all treatment because he could not afford further dialysis. And for a simple thing like renal failure and dialysis as a reason for for uh, to to pass is kind of sad and it's uh, it boils down to economics again uh, way back i remember our dean um, florentino herrera talking to us saying you have to also save for your health we have to educate people that uh, you know you can buy your car you can buy your your uh, <laughs> good things in life, but don't forget to save money for your health. Um, uh, again, all of these programs will need will need the economics part of it for it to be successful. Sometimes that's the sad truth. Um, um, but but again. Uh, Dr. Pagtaghan, I really admire your the path that you took, uh, which is going to politics and making sure that you make a difference in other people's life. And I think that's worthy of emulation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, all good things must come to an end. But uh, Dr. Santos and I, I would like to uh, underline his invitation. We are the co-host for webinars. We handle all sorts of disciplines, whether it's the space age, whether it is uh, DNA, whether it is the social, political, economic aspects of life. We are going to tackle them. And thank you, Dr. Pagtanghan, for such an inspiring and enlightening evening this morning. So, and thank you very much, everyone. Fe, Eclares, we cannot get this thing going without you. So thank you very much, Feb, for hosting this. 
We really appreciate it, and I want to express that publicly. So good evening, everybody. We were very honored with your presence tonight and morning. Thank you, and we now say goodbye. Salamat po. Au revoir. Salamat. Good night. Thank you. Thank you all, Dr. Bye. Okay, leave now. Thank you, Feli. Sis Feli. Okay. Are you still in the Philippines? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Billy. We'll be in touch. I will leave now.